Welcome to the Gifts for Glory podcast, where we celebrate and promote men and women using their gifts for God's glory. Know someone who is making an impact for God's kingdom using their gifts, talents, and passions? We'd love to meet them. Send us an email at podcast at giftsforglory.com. That's podcast at gifts, the number four, glory.com. And now here is our host, Dave Ebert. Hello, friends and neighbors. Welcome to the Gifts for Glory podcast. As this episode goes out, we are 10 days shy of Christmas Eve, so about nine more days until most men decide it's time to shop. (laughs) Uh, But seriously, I want to offer you my hope and prayers this holiday season. I hope that it's a a season of celebration, joy, and peace. This year, as has been highlighted over and over again, has been a very trying year. We've been separated from each other. We've had once-in-a-lifetime events taken away. We've had traditions stripped and discarded, and we've seen fear, anxiety, depression, anger, and sadness grip so many people in such painful ways. So this holiday season, whether you're able to celebrate in person or your family prefers to keep things distant, our prayer is that you would be blessed and that you would draw near to God, the God of the universe, our Father in heaven, who loves you with a love that is immeasurable and indescribable. God loves you and longs for a relationship with you. So we pray that you would lean into him and rely on him this holiday season, whether or not you're able to celebrate with family and friends, or you have to do it virtually or not at all. We also pray that you are able to keep healthy and safe and that your mental, physical, and spiritual health is strong in the Lord. So we hope that this holiday season is one of joy and celebration, health and peace. No matter what, God is on his throne and we can take joy in knowing he is there. And with that, let's jump into our Devotions with Dave segment for this week. This week I'll be reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong, Through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Now, the Bible is not a book that promises life is going to be easy. Nowhere does God promise a life of ease and comfort for those who seek him. Here, Peter reminds us that we must, not may, or might, or even possibly, but we must endure many trials. But he also gives us perspective. He tells us it's for a little while. However, the benefit of these trials will show us that our faith is genuine. The trials are testing us like fire to burn away the impurities. We are being refined like gold, but our lives and our souls and our faith are worth far more than gold. If our faith remains strong, We will bring praise and honor and glory when Jesus returns. Peter is telling us that there is a wonderful joy to come, which is the light at the end of the tunnel. It's the end of the journey to God. But we're going to have to go through some things on this side of eternity. Hard things, painful things, things that will scar, things that will, if we if we allow, will refine us and make us pure. Peter encourages us further in verse 8, for those of us who've came to life in the days after Jesus rose to heaven during the res- after the resurrection. We have never seen Jesus the way Peter and the apostles did. Peter recognized the gift of having been in Jesus' footsteps in his presence. So Peter appreciates those who love Jesus without having seen or been with Jesus in person. In rejoicing and loving and trusting in Jesus, especially having been born after Jesus walked the earth, we are setting ourselves up to receive the reward of salvation of our souls. The most precious gifts possible, the the freedom from the burden of sin, the freedom from the chains of hell, the freedom to be reconciled to God, the Father in heaven for eternity. Peter says it best, we rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Why? Because we love Jesus and we trust in him and the salvation he purchased with his own life. So in 1 Peter 1 verses 6 and 7, just remember, so be truly glad there is a wonderful joy ahead even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, 
So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring much praise. It will bring you much praise and joy and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. So hold on to that. So be truly glad there is a wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Wonderful joy, it's yours. Receive it and know that Jesus died for you because the Father loves you. So that is our Devotions with Dave segment for this week. Let's get on to our interview. This week we are joined by author, speaker, blogger, podcaster, and online host, Coach Elizabeth Myers. And she has a free gift for those who hear her story. So have a listen and then check out the show notes for those links. In our conversation today, we just discussed faith, overcoming tragedy, and how God will use tragedies just as he uses all things for the good of those who love him. Also during our interrogation segment, Liz gives us some great insight into how we should treat scripture. So here's our conversation with Elizabeth Myers on the Gifts for Glory podcast, where we celebrate and promote men and women using their gifts for God's glory. I'm now joined by an author, a speaker, a blogger, a podcaster, and an online coach, but I am talking about Elizabeth Myers. She's the author of Undefeated, From Trial to Triumph, and she's also the host of the podcast Resilient Life Hacks, which I think everybody's going to want to check out because who doesn't need another great life hack? We now bring on with us uh, Elizabeth Myers. Elizabeth, welcome to uh, the Gifts of Glory podcast. How are you? Yes, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate being asked to be on today. Absolutely. We're happy to have you. Uh, first, let's talk a little bit about the book, uh, Undefeated. Talk to us about a little bit, because we're going to get into your testimony a little bit later, but give us an overview of what the uh, the book is about. Yeah, so uh, basically, I, I was a Christian prior to the, the time that I experienced a traumatic event in my life, which we'll cover later. But following that, I really struggled with depression and anxiety, uh, really felt a great distance between myself and God. It was a long, slow process, healing and coming out of that. And part of what I was doing during that time of healing was journaling. And I was about three quarters of the way through my first notebook. And I'm like, I think this could be a book. I think this, you know, God could use this to help somebody else. And I really just kind of felt God gently nudging me like, you know, you need to share this with other people who are suffering and hurting, you know, share these things that you have learned. So that's really how the book came about. And then it, it's just kind of continued on from there. I started writing the book and it got to be too big. So I chopped <laughs> it up into three. I don't really know if a nonfiction trilogy is a thing, but I made it one. <laughs> so I'm trying now to finish the second book, which is a continuation of that one. And the uh, second book, hopefully out early of next year, is Undaunted. So will the uh, third book also have the same theme of an un at the beginning? Or Yes, the third one is un- Unshakable. Okay, nice. Oh, um, I don't know, that was... <laughs> That's how it came to me. <laughs> nice. So Undefeated is out. The second book, Undaunted, is on its way and uh, due in the early part of next year. Uh, now, tell us about Resilient Life Hacks. Uh, that's your podcast. It's only a couple of months old. Uh, what uh, was the inspiration for that one? Yeah, that's been a relatively new thing. I, I actually started trying to get on more podcasts to share my message with with a greater audience yeah. because I really feel like it's beneficial to a lot of people out there that are are suffering and struggling, especially this year has been so wackadoodle that, you know, all of us are are struggling with anxiety at some point. And um, so I was just trying to, you know, increase that. And I, being on these podcasts with with other hosts, I'm like, well, this is kind of cool. I want to do this too. (laughs) So I just sort of started it on my own. And I was planning to just kind of fill the content with, you know, things that I wanted to share for a while. But I had people reaching out to me right away Oh, I'd like to be on there. So I actually, I have my schedule filled up now through next January. Wow. Yeah. So I get to hear a different person's story each week. It's really neat. I enjoy talking. The whole theme is about resiliency. And so it's a lot of people who have gone through stuff and just tell how they overcame that or what their lessons learned are for, you know, having a stronger life. It's just really inspiring to hear everybody's story. You know, everybody's unique, but there's those common struggles and victories that we all share. Right. And so it's just that sense of camaraderie of, of hearing other people's stories. Awesome. Uh, we kind of touched on it a moment ago. Uh, tell us about your journey to faith. At what point did you find uh, Christ? And and you mentioned that you were a Christian before a major event happened. Yeah. So how did that change your faith? So, uh, you know, just take it away and tell us all about uh, your journey. Yeah, sure. I, I grew up in a Christian home, but I 
you know, as a child, I didn't like personally understand that, you know, that there was this relationship with God that I was supposed to have uh, as a, from my kid perspective, it was just this, what you do on Sundays right. and that was it. And I remember, you know, as a young child watching my dad read the Bible and I'd be like, why would my dad want to read a book so boring? because I had only heard the Bible quoted a verse at a time. And so I just thought the whole book was a collection of verses, you know, right. I didn't realize this, this epic drama, you know, I mean, talk about like crazy mini series, you know, major series, there's a lot in there. And um, so I just, you know, I just had that misunderstanding right. when I was about 12 um, was when I really first heard the gospel message, you know, the basic gist of it presented to me in a clear way. And, and I didn't really get all of it, but I thought, you know, if this is true, this isn't something I want to miss out on. So I did have, I I kind of marked that as my salvation experience of, you know, I did, I I prayed to God and, you know, I believed what I was able to believe at that point. And, you know, I believe that God would have honored my understanding at that point, but there was no dramatic change in my life Mm. because I I still really didn't get it. Uh, So, you know, I, over the years, I've heard other Christians testimonies. It's like, oh, my life was bad. And then I accept Jesus and then everything's great. And I just didn't have that story. It's like, my life was really pretty good before. And I accepted Jesus and it kind of kept just going on status quo. Um, But it was actually in college when I really started to understand what it meant to walk with Jesus daily. I went to the Air Force Academy, you know, so went through basic training and everything. And it was really just an experience of every crutch that I had leaned on in life got knocked out from under me. You know, I was kind of cut off from my family, which we were all really close. And, you know, I was used to being, you know, a top student and kind of appreciated. And there I'm with all the the nation's top students and we're all treated like pond scum. So, <laughs> you know, there was just a lot of things that tanked. And in basic training every evening, we were given the choice to eat. You could go to chapel. Um, there were several different varieties. Or you could stay in your room and the upper class were supposed to leave you alone. Mm. So I chose to stay in my room and write letters home. But the upperclassmen didn't leave me alone. They kept pestering me. So I actually, I went, I started going to chapel just to get away from the upperclassmen. Oh, and the wow. word sanctuary took on a whole new meaning. <laughs> to I don't know if you've seen the, the chapel at the Air Force Academy, but oh, it's like gorgeous. It's the triangle. With this. They're renovating it all now, so it's under scaffolding. But mm. um, I mean, it was really just my sanctuary. And I'd sit in the back and write letters home. But gradually, you know, I started, despite my best efforts, hearing the things that the chaplains were saying Hmm. and the songs started penetrating my heart. And I'm like, I I need this. This is what I'm missing. I need what these people have. And, you know, gradually I quit writing letters. I moved up a few rows, you know, I got closer. I started paying attention. There's a lot of the songs from that time and a lot of, you know, specific things I can remember the chaplain saying that just really meant a lot to me in that time. And so after basic training, I started going to a, a Bible study group that met off base once a week. And um, that was really where I just kind of started learning what it really meant to have a relationship with God and to have that impact your life every day, not just what you do on Sunday morning, but all the time. And um, so that was a a neat time of learning for me. I can remember early on, you know, they would say, turn your Bible to such and whatever. And I would not open my Bible because I didn't know where anything was. And I was too embarrassed because everybody seemed to be so up on, you know, well, this was Mm -hmm. here. And, you know, they knew the backstory of David and all this. You know, I had just the elementary school, you know, the little Bible storybook. Like, that's what I wrote the Bible. And um, so I was too embarrassed to open my Bible because I didn't want people to know I didn't know where anything was. (laughs) So I got those little tabs, you know, that you stick on your Bible where the books are. And so that gave me the confidence then to flip open to things. And I used that same Bible, like all four years I was there and even beyond that. And just gradually over time, one by one, they fell off, they'd rip off. And, they, and so it, just, it was great. It was a gradual weaning process of, you know, I just gradually lost the tabs. And by the time that they were all gone, I could figure out where things were pretty well. <laughs> so um, that was nice. But I think that's, that's a lesson I try to keep in my mind now, you know, when you're welcoming newer Christians or people who are seeking or whatever to, to be cognizant of not making them feel awkward about not knowing everything and right. just making that okay. It's just, it's just fine. Cause you know, everybody starts somewhere in yeah, and it's I think, not that anybody intentionally tried to make me feel bad, but I, you know, you, when you're in a new situation, you just feel awkward and self-conscious anyway. So, so oh. I, I grew through that time a lot and learned a lot of things. And then uh, after 
I graduated, I met my husband, you know, he's a, a great Christian guy too. And, you know, we got married, we had a um, great relationship. We started having kids, you know, and so I, I'm going through this time and I kind of had, I, in my book, I call it fair weather faith. If I just kind of had this concept that I think a lot of us have this misconception of if I do my part, if I, if I do all the things I'm supposed to do and don't do the things I'm not supposed to do, God's going to bless me and, and life's going to be awesome. And it had been, um, during that time. And so I think I just kind of had that misconception that if I'm following God, life's going to turn out well. And um, so there was in the, about the year 2000, spring of 2007 to the spring of 2008, I had a year period where just everything that could go wrong went wrong in my life. And right before that, I had had a time of, I was just really seeking God in prayer and really feeling the power of prayer. And I, I just entered this stage where it felt like everything i prayed for disintegrated. I would pray for people's healing and they would die. I prayed Mm -hmm. for marriages to be restored and they got divorced. I prayed for my friend who was having difficulty conceiving and she had a miscarriage. And Mm -hmm. I mean, it just went on and on and on. And I'm just like, what is going on? And then in the midst of all that, um, I lost my baby in the second trimester. Uh, He was stillborn while we were away on vacation. It was just really unexpected. And just the way it all happened was very traumatic for me kind of, you know, I struggled with PTSD type symptoms for a while of like replaying the images and, and all this kind of stuff. And, um, I just, it was that moment really that just kind of pushed me over the edge. And, um, I struggled in every way, you know, I was heartbroken mentally. I was just not thinking straight. Uh, I, I call it poisoned thinking. I just saw everything negatively. I really struggled physically. I had a lot of physical repercussions from everything that had happened and it, I just was really weak for a long time afterwards. And uh, worst of all, spiritually, I just, I had surrendered to trust God to create this pregnancy in the first place. I had five kids already. This was our sixth child. I have eight now. So we had three rainbow babies after that. But I had at some point in all that, I hadn't set out to have a big family. My right. husband wanted two and I wanted four. So we joked that we compromised and we multiplied. That's not actually what happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's just with each baby we had, with each child that came into our life, God changed our hearts a little more. Yeah. But I had to surrender to that. And then God took my baby and I had to surrender again. Mm-hmm. And that double surrender just crushed me. And I really just felt like God had abandoned me. I thought maybe he was angry at me. I'm like, what, what sin have I committed? You know, I went through all these things. And I just really felt alone. And so I kind of pulled back away from God, too. So I didn't, like I said before, I didn't have this. My life was this way, and then I came to Jesus, and then it, then it was better. But I more had this, things were okay. I came to Jesus. Things were still okay. Then I had a real tragedy. And now I'm on the other side of that saying, God is with us even in our darkest times, even in our deepest sorrows. He's still there then, too. And he's not angry with us. God is for us, not against us. And he still has something. He has a purpose in that pain. Um, So that's kind of my message now of that age old question that we all struggle with. Of You know, where's God when we suffer? How can an all sovereign, all loving God allow the stuff that goes on in humanity? And we've seen more than our fair share of it this year. Um, So those were the types of questions I wrestled with. And so in the book is where I kind of process through my thoughts on those things. Absolutely. Did you uh, right before you got to that moment of the 2007 2008 that whole time you said that you felt that or you were in this deeper uh power of prayer time looking back does it feel like God was preparing you to kind of help you into this season or Yeah, I can see that now that I felt like I was drawing closer to God and I I'm not sure if I'm wording this right, so just give me some grace. But I almost felt like we got to the point in our relationship where he trusted me with greater suffering. I don't know if that makes sense. Sure. But and and knowing that you know I would kind of pull away and we would have a strange relationship for many years, but coming out on the other side of that, how much deeper my faith would be because now it's grounded on truth that is firm, even when my life is not going well. Whereas before it was kind of on a shakier foundation of as long as life is good, God is good. God is good all the time. Yes. And so I do feel like that was kind of a growing thing. At the time, I felt like he was turning my back on me. But I have also since read from from other, you know, renowned Christians in the past who have written great things that, where they struggled with a period where they, they didn't hear from God. Yeah. And, and just learning that I'm not the only 
Christian who has sought God desperately and then felt silence. So I'm not, I'm not alone. <laughs> you know, right, there's, right. there's um, encouragement in that. Yeah, I've uh, read and I've heard that Mother Teresa once said that she's only ever heard or she had only ever heard from God once in her entire ministry. And uh, the amazing things that she's able to do just by being obedient to that one time. You're in good company when you're in a point where you feel like you're not hearing God because uh, it's very cliche. It's very Christianese, but they always say the teacher is always silent during the test. But it doesn't make it easier. It makes it feel harder. In some ways, in a smaller way, you kind of feel like Jesus, like, Father, why have you forsaken me mm-hmm. you when know, he's out yeah. there on the cross? So what got you through and got made you kind of turn back to God after going through all that? Was it your husband? Was it somebody on the outside that was looking in? Uh, what, what turned well, it for you? It was within. I basically just got sick and tired of being sick and tired. Okay. And I, my theory of human behavior is that change is hard. And so by and large... People don't want to change until the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of changing. And I got to that point in my life. I went for five years with untreated depression. We had three more babies, three more military moves, you know, three more changing your whole friend set. It's hard to go through something even, you know, when you do have close friends. When you're picking up and moving every year or two, uh, it just makes, you know, the continuation of your healing more difficult because it gets interrupted. Um, And I just, I got to the point where I'm like, I, I cannot do this anymore. And I don't remember this specific like moment when I thought that, but I do remember the conversation I had with my husband. And I, I, I told him, I'm like, I just, I can't live like this anymore. Something is wrong and I've got to get help. I had tried to get help early on, but I had kind of been brushed aside. And so then I just gave up and I just, I stuffed everything. I, you know, I plastered yeah. the pile on him. I did, I'm fine, you know? Yeah. And there was this real kind of, it's just a prideful thing, but I was, I was ashamed of the fact that I was struggling with mental health. Um, I felt like a Christian should be joyful and peaceful and I was anxious and depressed. And I, you know, it's like, what's wrong with me as a Christian that I can't get it together and feel all the ways I'm supposed to feel. I, I often remember thinking, you know, I'd hear a sermon or listen to something and they're like, Oh, you know, this, this, and this. I'm like, yeah, that's how I feel. And they're like, just give your heart to Jesus and then everything will be better. And I'm like, but I already did that. (laughs) And I'm miserable. And I remember thinking, I feel as lost as a saved person can be. That was, right. that was how I felt in that moment. I'm like, I would love to give myself over to Jesus, but I did that. And this is, that's how I got to where I am. So I just, I struggled um, with all those things. But I, I told my husband in that conversation that, you know, I don't know what the root cause is. You know, I don't know if it's a physical thing or if I'm, you know, if it's a mental health thing or is this all a spiritual thing because I'm angry with God and this is my punishment, you know. Mm. So I just decided I'm going to, hit it on all four fronts, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. And I made deliberate steps to reach out and get help in those four areas. And that's really what my second book is about is more those details of this is how I build strength in my life in these areas to overcome adversity, you know, to prepare for future adversities. But also ultimately our goal is to live the purpose that God created us for. And we can't do that when we're all tangled up and bogged down in our own pain and our own brokenness because we're all broken but with god's help and healing we can overcome that and then then we use the comfort that he gave us to reach out and to comfort other people and so that's ultimately where we want to get to but we have to deal with our own issues first before we can turn around you know it's just like an airplane where you have to put on your own mask first before you can help the next person right exactly and not that we're we never arrive there you know i mean i'm I'm still a broken person but sure (laughs) You know, uh, healing is always a journey, and we're not, we're never going to be perfect till we get to heaven. But exactly. So, how did the the loss of the baby affect your husband, and then the things that you were going through? How was he doing that? Uh, was he strong by your side, or did it also hit him so hard that he wasn't? He was the the guy in the airplane, not putting on his own mask. Yeah, we we had very different experiences of that, and our culture in general just doesn't really know how to grieve a child that wasn't ever born. Um, you know, he, he died in early in the second trimester. And, um, so, you know, when he, when he was born, he was born deceased, he had probably died a few days before. So his body was still, but you know, he fit in the palm of my hand, Mm -hmm. just this tiny little, little baby boy, you know, looked perfect other than the fact that he was way too little. Um, and that had just, it, it hit me really hard. To me, it was the same as if I had lost any of my other children. And when people would say to me, 
well, you know, at least it was only the second trimester. You know, at least he had mm. To me, that's like saying, well, at least your kid was only three and not five because you would have been more attached to him at five. And that just, that's not my experience of it. And right. I know even among different women, different women have different experiences um, with, with miscarriage and with pregnancy loss. And everybody grieves in their, in their own way. For my husband, it was not as traumatic for him. He felt a very distinct difference between losing that child versus, you know, if we had lost one of our children that were born, you know, that he had more of an experience with. And, you know, I think part of that is just the fact of, you know, as the mother, I'm, I'm like carrying this baby, like our, our bodies are together. We're, you know, sure. we're in this from the beginning, you know, for my husband, it, it just becomes more real when the baby actually shows up and is there. Um, right. You know, it's just a different experience. So he had a little trouble getting it, you know, at first of like, why are you so upset? You know, I don't, understand so that was something that we had to work through but what's been interesting is god even uses that he's a air force officer now he's a commander and as the leader of military units he has had so many opportunities to help other dads when their wife loses a baby to kind of counsel them and say hey you know you need to take off work and go be with her and go and i don't know exactly what all he said but i know Guys and also their spouses have come back to us and said, thank you so much for talking to me. You really helped us through this difficult time. So God has put him in a position where he can sort of coach other dads on, on how to deal with that and how to, to deal with a spouse who's grieving when they maybe don't necessarily get it. Yeah. yeah I could see you know, being a man that because you get excited, you get joyful, and you're, you're it's more of you're excited about the future and what this means as opposed to, I mean, you're, there's still excitement over the ultrasounds and such, yeah. but for him, it's much different because you as the woman were carrying it. Um, but it, it turns out God is even redeeming that time to where he can use maybe in some ways and not, not being mean, but maybe his mistakes and how he handled it. Yeah. Um, I think because, we both made a lot of mistakes. We were not prepared for what we dealt with that day. Right. And I, you know, there's a lot, about that day that I would go back and change. I, I just, I made decisions that day that I was not prepared to handle. It was not something I had ever thought through. And um, so, you know, I think we were both muddling through it. And I, I didn't know that I was depressed. You know, I didn't know that's what it was. I knew something was wrong. And, you know, at first I thought it was a physical thing because I had lost so much blood. I was anemic and they said, Oh, it'll take uh-huh. two months for you to regrow your blood. Well, three mo- months came and went and I'm like, I still, feel miserable <laughs> and they tested my blood they're like oh you're fine you know come back in a year if you still feel that mm. so you know it, it was hard for me to figure out what was wrong with me much less communicate it you know and i so it's it's taken me a lot of years to be able to process all these things and, I, and i've been through several rounds of, of counseling of christian counseling uh you know and I, i've sought professional help i've been to you know talk to pastors i've had prayer you know i've done all these different things uh, and mostly just spent time alone with God in my Bible, honestly. Um, so there has been healing, but that that all took time. And so what I'm expressing now is the result of several years of work. And I, I couldn't have expressed all of this back then. All I knew was that I was heartbroken and I didn't know where God was. Yeah. And I think the church is getting better slowly. Uh, but it, for many, many years, the church did not receive a diagnosis of mental illness as something that was serious and needed treatment, needed counseling, that needed work. They thought, well, if you pray enough or if you give enough to the Lord as far as like your time or if you unload your burdens, you'll be fine. And I think that there's a lot of people who are in a place where they needed a lot of help and they were denied it because it wasn't a visible scar. It wasn't cancer that they knew was something serious um so was your church supportive at all or were they kind of in that oh just pray it pray it through you'll be yeah. fine at the time we were in a really small church and um initially like so i i lost the baby while we were visiting family in texas but then we went back to where we were stationed at the time was in alabama and actually a week later is when i started hemorrhaging really bad it happened to be on a sunday morning so the pastor's wife actually came and took all my other kids. Um, you know, somebody came to the hospital and prayed with us. People brought us food. All of that for, like, that day. Mm-hmm. 
but then it just kind of evaporated. Um, you know, I, I got a couple of cards, I think, or whatever, but then people just expected us to pick up and move on. More of the Gifts for Glory podcast in just a moment. Our host, Dave Ebert, is now accepting bookings for your next event. Dave specializes in improv coaching to improve self-esteem, team camaraderie, communication, creativity, and developing your own unique voice. Improv is an amazing tool to learn how to listen actively, respond appropriately, and communicate more efficiently, all while having an absolute blast. For churches and ministries, ask about our Improv Your Witness workshop, designed to get you out of your own way when sharing the gospel and your testimony. For information, contact booking at giftsforglory.com. Booking at gifts, the number four, glory.com booking at giftsforglory.com. We'll be back with more of this amazing conversation next on the Gifts for Glory podcast, where we celebrate and promote men and women using their gifts for God's glory. You know, somebody came to the hospital and prayed with us. People brought us food. All of that for like that day. But then it just kind of evaporated. Um, you know, I, I got a couple of cards, I think, or whatever. But then people just expected us to pick up and move on. And just, you mentioned cancer. There was a, a woman in our church at the time who, who was going through cancer. And, you know, every Sunday they'd bring her up and they'd lay hands on her and they'd pray for her. And she got all this support. And I feel terrible about this, but I was, like, jealous of that. I was sure. like, I, I don't have a physical ailment like cancer, but I am suffering and nobody sees it or acknowledges it. And I know, you know, I often went up for prayer at the end of church. And for whatever reason, I don't know, just the style of our pastor at the time, he he didn't ask what you wanted prayer for. He would just pray for you. I I guess he was depending on the Holy Spirit to tell him. Sure. And so I was sobbing. You know, I just went up sobbing. It was right before our family was going to go on vacation. And I just could not pull it together. And so, you know, he prayed for me that I would have a good vacation. And I was just kind of like, he just, there's some disconnect between me and the Holy Spirit and this man who's praying for me because he's not hitting it at all. Uh-huh. And so in my messed up thinking, you know, I said I had poison thinking. So again, I took that as like, well, God must not care about me or he would have told uh-huh. that pastor what I needed. You know, I, I, I put all this twisted thinking on everything um, and just made it worse. You know, every, every little thing that happened, I took that as some evidence that God was against me, right. Um, right. which is not right. But that's. That's how I got down this road where I did thinking God didn't love me is because I took all those little things like that. How deep did your depression get? Was it, were you thinking of anything like any final steps or were you just in this mode that you just didn't want to do anything? Where, how deep did, did it go? I Like as far as being suicidal, I don't know that I would describe it that way. It wasn't like I planned um a way to kill myself or anything. But especially early on, I just had a super strong desire to be where my son was. And I knew my son was in heaven. And I think part of that is just a maternal thing. Sure. But I just, I really, really wanted to be with him. And I do remember at one point, you know, at a low point feeling angry with God that he didn't take me when he took my son, that he left me behind. Like I felt cheated. Um, So it wasn't necessarily that I wanted to die or wanted to kill myself. But I really didn't want to be on this earth anymore. I really just thought this life stinks. And I want to be with Jesus where everything's great. I want to be with my son. But it was the the weight of five other children depending on me. That they're what got me out of bed every day. What kept me going. What, you know, as long as they're here and I'm their mom, I have a purpose and a reason to be on this earth, even if it's painful and it doesn't make sense. I've got to. I've got to run this race that God's put before me. And so God just really used those five little treasures to, to just keep me going. That was all that kept me going. You know, if I, if I hadn't had them, I probably would have been more suicidal, but I, I just felt a tremendous, um, I don't want to say burden of responsibility because that sounds like drudgery, but you know, just love for them that I wanted to be there for them. You had a motivation for my suffering to them. That that doesn't make sense. Yeah, and you know, kids make a, a great motivator, and it, you know, like I said, it gave you the purpose. And when you're dealing with a tragedy, sometimes finding that a purpose to keep you going gets you in the habit of still living despite your grieving. Mm-hmm. So it was really awesome that that they were there. How old were they? And did the kid, did your other kids feel anything or notice anything as a result? Um, 
So when it first happened, we, we told our, our children then, and our oldest was, he would have been like eight or nine. Oh, okay. Um, and so I, he was sad, you know, we had, they knew that we were expecting a baby and, you know, we had talked about it all the time. And, um, so he cried a little, the others were younger and just didn't seem to register with sure. it. Um, but later, you know, like a year or two later, my, my daughter, my second oldest, so she would have been seven at the time. She started going through a grieving process. Mm. Um, and she confided in a Sunday school teacher that we had at church. She was, she's very artistic. Even to this day, she's like ultra creative, but she would draw pictures, you know, and draw our family and draw Timothy up in heaven, you know, and different things like that. And um, so as far as I'm aware, she was the only one that kind of went through a grieving thing. And I, it was very difficult for me to know how to handle that because I wasn't handling it well myself. How am I supposed to guide somebody else through it when I don't know what I'm doing? So I struggled with that, but doing art together was kind of a thing that we did. And so I, I kept all the pictures that she drew that have Timothy in them. Um, and I have those in a notebook. So it was kind of just our special way of bonding through that time. Um, and we do, you know, we're open about it as a family, you know, the three younger kids that have now come along. Now my youngest is eight. He's wow. just peeking into the room. Of <laughs> go. But um, they know, you know, that they have an older brother named Timothy. They know where he falls in the lineup. And we have done things to, uh, you know, remember him in May it was uh, Memorial Day weekend is when he passed. So either then or in November is his uh, due date, you know, when, he, when his birthday is supposed to be. So uh, sometimes at those times of year, we do something to celebrate or to mark that day. Sure. So you finally get out of this depression. Uh, you kind of pull yourself up basically by your bootstraps, leaning in on God, leaning in on his word. When did, uh, you know, going out and speaking and using your experience to minister, when did that start to come into play? Yeah, so it was all very gradual. It just really started, like I said, with that journal. And um, as I'm writing that, I just kind of felt like God saying, hey, you need to get this out there for other people. And so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll write a book. You know, so I just Googled how to write a Christian book. <laughs> <laughs> and I came up with, well, if you're going to be an author, you need a blog. So I'm like, okay, fine. I'll start a blog. You know, so I did that and that was great. It really just kind of gave me practice of writing publicly and just putting stuff out there and, and kind of refining it. And I think when the book finally did come out, it, it made it better. Several people have commented to me that they like how the book is broken down into readable chunks of information that it's easy to read, easy to scan. And um, that's a thing I learned from blogging because nobody actually reads blogs. They scan blogs. So, sure. you know, you make it visually easy for them to follow your train of thought. So that that happened. And then um, with our military moving around and then I've, I've had some health struggles, I kind of took a, a break there for a little while. But, you know, I, I feel this, you know, that nudging from God of you, you can't give up on this. You know, this is what I'm asking you to do. So I had a, a church that we used to go to, you know, when we were in another state. And they asked me to, to speak at their women's retreat um, on the book. And so um, I did that. And that was just so rewarding to watch God at work in the lives of these women. Um, yeah. It's just everybody coming together. The pastor's wife had had asked everyone not everyone, I'm sorry, like four different women to give their testimony each time before I spoke. And I was just amazed at how it just dovetailed perfectly with the message. And it's like, it was stuff like only God could do. Right. There was one talk and I was practicing what, and I'm like, this is missing something. There's some key ingredient. This is missing. And I just kind of felt like God say, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I've got it covered. And I was like, ah, uh, <laughs> I, I, it's missing some, you know, I'm like, okay. Well, the woman who spoke right before me told this story um, about her relationship with her father, and it was all about forgiveness. And I was like, that's the piece it was missing, was forgiveness. And so, like, God supplied the missing piece. He didn't give it to me, though. He gave it to somebody else. Yeah. And that was just so cool to see him working in all these lives of these different women, these different stories coming together. And I was just, I remember thinking that weekend, I'm like, I could really get addicted to this. Like, just mm -hmm. have a front row seat to what God is doing in people's hearts. Um, and so, uh, as I described earlier, you know, I've been trying to, to do more speaking things to share the message with more people who need help, especially in this year. And so that's where the podcasting has come in. And now 
in this season, most speaking engagements are virtual. <laughs> right, right. So um, that works out. So it's just kind of been one little one little thing at a time. It's, and, um, you know, as I kind of learn something to get comfortable with that, then God kind of nudges me out to the next thing. And I'm like, okay, I don't really know how to do this either. <laughs> but I just, okay, let's go. And just kind of dig in. So a lot of this journey involves God saying, I'm going to take you to a land you haven't seen or known. Oh, yeah. Just go with me. And uh, right. this goes on. And uh, you've been out sharing your testimony, your story, and then you decided to do the podcast, Resilient Life Hacks. Tell us a little bit more about what the format of the show is about and what people will get when they tune in. Yeah, so it's really kind of just three parts. We just kind of have a, a quick introduction. And then the bulk of it is is the person sharing their story of what they overcome came and how they overcame it. And what I asked them to focus on is, you know, what lessons learned do you have to share with other people? Uh, my most recent one was a woman who dealt with anxiety and she just gave some really good practical tips on just dealing with anxiety, you know, in the moment, depending on Christ to help us in those moments when our, our thoughts are running away from us, um, different things like that. And then um, at the end, I just give them time to share, you know, whatever project they're working on or, you know, their book or their website or whatever thing it is that they do where people can connect with them and follow up if, if they want more information. So, um, but really the bulk of it is a story with these are the lessons I learned and, you know, take which ones help you and use those in your story. So of the ones that you've released thus far, which one would you say is, if you're going to listen to one of my episodes, I want you to listen to this one first. Um, gosh, I don't know. You know, my, my favorite one is always the one I just did. Right. <laughs> so, but it's like picking um, your favorite kid, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I really, I mean, the one that's fresh on my mind is the one from last week. It's Ginger Harrington. Um, she's the author of a book, Holy in the Moment. But she really just talks about depending on Christ in every moment. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, we, it was only like a half hour, but I was just like, wow, there were so many good nuggets in there. Like, I need to go back and rewatch it and take notes mm -hmm. <laughs> and keep these things in mind for me when my thoughts are going a little cuckoo. Um, so it was just some really good, practical, really good biblical information that I think a lot of people can get help from. And uh, we'll have the details on how to find the book as well as the podcast in our show notes for people to follow. And we'll uh, also link to the, uh, this most recent edition so people can check that one out as well. I know in the uh, information you sent, you said something about you like to share a resource with our listeners. What's that resource and uh, how, how can they get that? Yeah, I, I have several free resources on my website, but the one that I like to share for podcasts is I do have a free PDF version of my book that you can download and you can read that there. And it's really just, you know, I just want to help as many people as I can. And so I, I feel like that's a thing that I can offer out there to, to share with other people. So it's just my website, elizabethmyers.me slash free book. Uh, okay. So I, I tried to make it easy to remember. <laughs> yeah. All right. And that will be uh, the first link we'll put in the show notes for anybody that okay. is interested Great. in uh, grabbing that. And also uh, we'll link, to, uh, of course, to the podcast. And, and, uh, and we'll also keep an eye out for when that second book is coming out for uh, hopefully January of 2021. But... That's the plan, but life has a way of happening, yeah. especially this year. So. so Lord willing and the creek don't rise is what we say in the South. Yep. <laughs> One of the things that we do as we wrap up our show is it's called the interrogation. It's seven quick random questions to cover some bases that maybe wouldn't have fit in the other part of the conversation. Okay. So the uh, first question would be, you're down in North Carolina, Char Heels or uh, Blue Devils? I, you know, I'm not like a big sports person really <laughs> of anything which is terrible I'm a, I'm a native Texan and I don't even like football which is like darn near blasphemous <laughs> but um my big sport thing honestly is the Olympics I was really bummed they got canceled this year yeah and more because I not because of the sports but I love all the stories because mm. you know it's so many stories of of triumph over tragedy which is like the whole theme of what I'm into and I just I love those but of those two it's of course, gymnastics in the summer and figure skating in the winter. <laughs> That's about as close to sports as I get. Okay. Question number two, of all the places that you've lived through military, uh, moving around, what's been your favorite place to live? We get that question a lot, and it's hard to answer because they've all been our favorite. Sure. And really what we've learned over time is every place is really what you make of it. 
Right. And every place we've lived, there are people who enjoy that place and people who are miserable there. And usually the ones who are miserable there are the ones who just made up their mind they're going to be miserable, that they don't like that place. And, you know, we were in Alaska for a few years, and the only people I know who didn't love it were the ones who never got out of their house. And it's like, well, of course you're not going to like it if you don't <laughs> venture outdoors every now and then. Um, so really, I, I know it's kind of cliche to say bloom where you're planted, but God has something good for us in every place we've been to. And I, it's funny because I always like miss the last place that we were at. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I always like miss the last church we were at. And it takes me a good six months to nine months to really get plugged into the new church because I'm still like missing my friends or the teaching or the worship songs or whatever at the last church. But then we moved to the next place and then I miss that one. So. Right, right. That makes sense. We're, we're, my husband's getting ready to retire next year and after 25 years of military service. So we are going to stop. We're going to make one final move to Texas. This is the plan anyway. Of course, God may have other plans for us. So then that's kind of a whole new level of weird of like not moving again. It's like, because right. when we get somewhere and we don't like something about it, it's like, well, we're only going to be here two years. We'll make the best of it. Uh, but we don't have that option on the next move. So that's going to be interesting. <laughs> It's kind of like the old saying, you don't like the weather, give it five minutes, it'll change. Yeah, right. All right. So kind of a follow-up to the last one. Of all the places you visit, you've been a- or lived, you've been able to see different food types, different cuisines. What's been your favorite food type uh, as you've traveled? Hmm. Well, you know, it could be a restaurant or it could be cuisine. Well, I mean, our favorite food type is Mexican food, but that really has more to do with being from Texas, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, We did live in Korea for a year, so I would put that in the most interesting food group category. Some of it I liked, some of it I didn't. (laughs) You have to be very adventurous. I'll just put it that way. Uh, You know, some things are still, like, alive when you eat them. Um, And so, yeah, there was a lot of adventures there. Um, And then we we lived in Rhode Island for a little while, so that was a lot of seafood, which we're not huge seafood people, but... When you go to the restaurant where they cook it right, it's actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, so that was just kind of a different different thing. But I would say what's more different than the cuisine actually is the driving. We were really? stationed early on in uh, New Jersey. And it's just like they have these traffic circles and you really just have to step on the gas and close your eyes and pray. That's the right. only <laughs> way you can get out into the intersection. And we moved from there to Oklahoma where the – Roads are laid out in mile grids with a four-way stop at every intersection, and everybody stands there going, you go first. No, you go first. And I'm just like, well, somebody please go. I just moved here from New Jersey, and I'm in a hurry. <laughs> then we went to Rhode Island, where they don't understand right-of-way. So uh, it was just, you know, everywhere we've gone, there's like different driving, unspoken driving rules that you have to get used to. So that's been more of an adjustment for me than the food. Next question, uh, number four. Well, what has been your worst, other than the tragedy as part of your testimony, but what's been the worst part about uh, tr- all your travels and moving from place to place? I get really tired of packing and unpacking. Um, if I had it to do over again, I think I would have started traveling lighter. You know, like minimalism wasn't a thing back in mm-hmm. the 90s when we started all this, but I, I should have gone that route. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to collect a little too much clutter and then that makes it harder to move. Um, but really, it's just the, it's the starting over every time. You know, yeah. you have to find a new dentist and you have to figure out the new traffic rules and you've got to find, you know, a new place to shop and all these different things. Um, just starting over is hard. It, you know, it takes a good several months to tear down in one place and several months to start up in the new place. And by then a year of my life has gone by. And this is why I don't make five-year goals. I just kind of laugh at five-year goals. I'm like, I don't <laughs> even know where I'm going to be living next summer. So I can't tell you what I'm doing in five years. Question number five. What's the last scripture that stepped on your toes? Stepped on my toes. Hmm. Like, I don't know that I can think of one recently. I know when I was going through my difficult time, it was Psalm 91 that tripped me up a lot. Mm. It's all about, you know, the Lord's going to protect you and the sun won't scorch you and the plague won't get you. You know, it's going to strike everybody, but it will avoid you and all these different things. And it just goes on and on and on with all these amazing rosy promises. And I'm just like, that's not the reality that I'm experiencing. Like, what did mm-hmm. God mean when he promised this? Because, you know, it did strike my tent. There is, tr- it says something in there about, uh, you know, you'll trample on evil. And I'm like, I feel like I'm the one being trampled. You know, how, how is this truth? 
if it doesn't match my experience. So that was the one that I really struggled with um, during that time. But what has helped me is I've learned to flip the filter on it. I, in that time period, I was comparing scripture to my experience and going, okay, this, this doesn't match up. Therefore scripture must be false. But I've learned to flip that around and go, okay, scripture is true. In light of that truth, how do I then interpret my experiences based through the filter of the scripture? And so just going, going in with the argument of, okay, God does love me. Now, how do I interpret this suffering experience that I've had in light of that truth? rather than trying to judge whether God really loves me or not, or whether that scripture is true. Um, so that's really helped flip my thinking around to be able to handle those tricky verses better. So I, I don't trip on them as quite as much as I used to. Question number six, in uh, all of your speaking engagements and appearances, uh, what has been the most embarrassing moment or has there been an embarrassing moment to speak? Um, I'm trying to think. I'm sure there's been one. I can't think of what it, would be well uh, okay so again maybe it's just maybe my memory's bad and i just always go back to what the most recent thing that happened was but the last podcast i was on i actually got totally messed up on the time <laughs> <laughs> and so i was like 15 minutes late and the guy called me like hey are you gonna show up and i'm like ah and i said is this a video or an audio <laughs> He's like, it's, it's just audio i'm like okay then i can do it now if it was video i'm gonna need a few minutes um so I was all rattled, you know, and I usually kind of prepare and study. And, and all I had in that moment was that, you know, one minute prayer of, oh, Lord, please help me. <laughs> I'm not ready. <laughs> and But, you know, whenever I say, God, I've, I've done the best I could, even if I've messed up, but I showed up. Now I need you to show up. And he always does, you know, and he really yeah. just uh, helped me express myself in spite of the fact that I was rattled. But I, I really felt bad, like showing up late to that because I try to keep everything on time. It was actually my child that reminded me. She's like, mom, don't you have a podcast today? And I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, I think I do. You're right. All right. Final question is if you could book any guest for your podcast, resilient life hacks, living or dead, who would you want? Hmm. And you can't say Jesus. That'd be too easy. <laughs> yeah. So the first one that pops into mind is Corey Tin Boom. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I would just love, I mean, I've read her book, you know, and I've seen clips of her speak, but uh, what, just the power of forgiveness in her life. Mm, um, yeah. You know, I would love to hear more about that. And, you know, and how do you do that? And how do you, how do you live through something that bad and, and still come out as a loving person and believing in God? Yeah. Like the story of the, uh, the old man that uh, came up to her uh, who had been the prison guard that uh, was involved in killing her family and he asked yeah. for forgiveness yeah how do you do that right, right. and the, the answer is of course she didn't do it that was god through her but still yeah. how do you allow god to let that happen so yeah that that would yeah. be an awesome interview that'd be an awesome conversation and maybe you and you'll probably get a chance to stand in line and let that happen on the eternity side <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I have a lot of questions when I get to eternity. <laughs> uh, the Bible doesn't give me enough details on some of these stories. I'm like, what was that guy thinking? You know, and I would love to just go ask him, like, what was going through your mind when you did that? <laughs> <laughs> I have a uh, friend uh, that's on my comedy team. She does some stand up. She tells a story about the guy that fell out of the window and died listening to Paul preach. And she tells this story and this joke about what happens when he went home that night. Because you got to know that he got some sort of ribbing, or his wife is like, "Where have you been?" You know. Mm -hmm. So it's so yeah, filling in those gaps of what the Bible, and it's not saying the Bible is incomplete. It's just saying that right, right. You know, there's not enough room to tell everything. Right, right. God just hits the important points, but there's a lot of like more gossipy kind of stuff that I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> if it was important, God would have told me. But I'm still curious. <laughs> The uh, final thing that I asked our guests, it's what is your wise counsel for somebody that wants to use their gifts or talents or passions for God's glory? What would you tell them? Um, I say just trust God and, you know, obey when you hear that little nudge going out. And I, for me personally, my, my stumbling block is I'm a perfectionist. I don't want to put myself out there unless I can do it right, you know. It's been a learning, pro you know, I explained to you how I, how I did things. And she's like, okay, God gives me this idea. I'm like, okay, I'll go do it. You know, I just, I launch a blog and I, I don't really know what I'm doing. You know, I started writing a book. I didn't really know what I was doing, but you just get out there and you learn on the way. 
I use the analogy of, you know, it's easier to steer a bike that's moving. You can't just balance on a bike that's standing still. Right. You're going to fall over. So you got to just kind of push off and go. And yeah, you're going to wobble some. You might take a spill. But, you know, that's that's life. And the way that I kind of get over my perfectionist tendencies or, or fear, really, of just making a mistake, fear of looking foolish is, you know, I just think about my little kids when they were learning to walk. You know, they stand up and they take a few steps and they fall down. And, you know, and I, as the mom sitting there going, oh, my goodness, you can't get this right. You know, no, you, you kind of just chuckle and you laugh and you get them up again. And it's like, hey, they're, they're going again. And I if I can keep that picture in my head, that's how God is towards us. You know, he's yeah. not condemning us saying you fell down. He's like, yeah, you're doing it. You're taking a step. Um, so just one step at a time. And you don't have to have all the lights turn green before you leave your house. You know, you just start driving. And if you yeah. hit a red light, you stop and you wait and you, you know, you get lost, you ask for direction. Um, but I think sometimes we can get in this mindset of waiting for the right time or waiting for everything to be perfect. And that's not going to happen. And then you wind up, it's too late. And now, you know, you can't do anything about it, or it's too late to do that thing that you felt called to. And, and then we have to live with the regrets, which yeah. I think the regrets are worse than the failing and making a mistake and going, oops, and just you know, learn from it and keep going. Absolutely. Well, that is our show. Uh, Elizabeth Myers, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, again, for everyone listening, uh, the links uh, will be in our show notes. Uh, be sure to also check out Resilient Life Hacks. It's uh, a great podcast. A lot of great nuggets you can pull out of there. And uh, uh, she's, she's an amazing host and even better guest. So I really appreciate you being on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Are you looking for a speaker for your next event? A guest pastor to fill in and give your staff a break? A moving testimony to share the hope found in Christ alone? For this and more, our host Dave Ebert is now taking bookings to share his testimony, his love of laughter, and the joy of the Lord with your audience. For information, contact booking at giftsforglory.com. Booking at gifts, the number four, glory.com. Booking at giftsforglory.com. 